Hello, this is Vivian Chu. I will be talking about infective endocarditis. This is the module on microbiology and treatment. The learning objectives of this module are to examine the spectrum of microbiological pathogens causing infective endocarditis, to identify the most common pathogens causing infective endocarditis, specifically to understand the classic clinical features of Staph aureus, streptococcal, and enterococcal infective endocarditis. And finally, to understand the principles of antimicrobial therapy and surgery for the treatment of infective endocarditis. Infective endocarditis is usually caused by bacteria, but can also be caused by fungi and viruses. This pie chart shows the distribution of microorganisms causing infective endocarditis. The three most common causes of infective endocarditis are Staph aureus, Streptococci, and Enterococci. Let's look at these etiologies in greater detail. Again, the three most common causes of infective endocarditis are Staph aureus, Streptococci, and Enterococci. Coagulase negative staph, pictured in purple here, are also a relatively common cause of infective endocarditis. Staph aureus, streptococcal, and enterococcal infective endocarditis will be discussed in greater detail in the next few slides. Starting from the top of the chart, blood cultures are negative in a small proportion of cases, and this will be discussed in a separate module. Typical fungi that cause infective endocarditis include Candida and Aspergillus. HASEC is an acronym for five gram-negative microorganisms, including Haemophilus aprophilus, Actinobacillus actinomycetum comitans, Cardiobacterium hominis, Echinella carotens, and Kingella kingi. Staph aureus is the most common cause of infective endocarditis in industrialized countries. Staph aureus endocarditis has increased over the past few decades mostly because of an increase in healthcare-associated infections. Staph aureus infective endocarditis can occur on previously normal heart valves, as well as on damaged ones. It manifests as acute infective endocarditis and typically has a fulminant course with metastatic spread of infection to other organs. Pictured here is a CT scan showing embolic lung lesions in a patient with infective endocarditis due to Staph aureus. It is useful to compare and contrast two main presentations of Staph aureus infective endocarditis, healthcare-associated and intravenous or injection drug use associated. Healthcare-associated infection is related to hospitalization, nursing homes, long-term intravascular catheters, and recent procedures. It occurs in older individuals with a high rate of comorbidities such as diabetes, immunosuppression, and hemodialysis. Healthcare-associated infective endocarditis is associated with a high rate of complications such as heart failure, stroke, and death. In contrast, with intravenous drug use-associated endocarditis, the infection is related to drug use where particulate matter in the drugs causes damage to the heart valves, while bacteria are introduced into the bloodstream through needles. This occurs in younger individuals with oftentimes few or no comorbidities. Intravenous drug use associated infective endocarditis is associated with a high rate of complications. However, it's usually associated with a lower rate of death because of the younger age of the patients involved. Streptococci have traditionally been the most common cause of infective endocarditis. This is still the case for non-industrialized countries and community-based cohorts. However, in industrialized countries such as the U.S., streptococci have been superseded by Staph aureus as the most common cause of infective endocarditis. The type of streptococci most commonly involved are Viridans group streptococci, which are normal inhabitants of the oral cavity. Streptococcal infective endocarditis typically occurs in patients with pre-existing valve disease, such as rheumatic heart disease, mitral valve prolapse, and congenital heart disease. 
Streptococcal infective endocarditis is a classic example of subacute endocarditis in that it has an indolent presentation where patients have low-grade fevers and nonspecific symptoms. Streptococcal infective endocarditis is associated with a lower rate of complications and death than Staph aureus infective endocarditis. Enterococci are the third most common cause of infective endocarditis. Enterococcal infective endocarditis typically occurs in older men after genitourinary procedures and in young women after urogynecologic procedures. Enterococcal infective endocarditis has a subacute presentation. It is difficult to treat because enterococci have high intrinsic resistance to antibiotics. In addition, enterococcal infective endocarditis has a relatively high mortality rate because of the older age of individuals involved and the high rate of antibiotic resistance. The treatment of infective endocarditis relies on prolonged courses of parenteral or intravenous bactericidal antibiotics. Sometimes combination therapy is required and the duration of therapy is determined by the infecting microorganism as well as the type of endocarditis, whether it's native or prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. The specific regimens for the treatment of infective endocarditis can be found in the American Heart Association guidelines. As an example, here are the guidelines for the treatment of Staph aureus prosthetic valve endocarditis. It is important to note that the regimens differ for native versus prosthetic valve endocarditis. In this case, for prosthetic valve endocarditis, combination therapy is recommended, which involves a beta-lactam, such as nafcillin, in combination with rifampin and gentamicin. As you can see, prolonged treatment with at least six weeks is recommended. Again, the specific regimens will differ according to the microbiologic etiology, as well as antibiotic susceptibilities, and whether the patient has native versus prosthetic valve endocarditis. When treating a patient for infective endocarditis, it is always important to consider whether or not the patient is a candidate for surgery. The question of surgery must be considered on an individual basis for each patient based on the presence of indications for surgery, which we will review in the next slide. The benefits of surgery are that the infected tissue is removed, there's a reduced risk of embolization from the vegetation, and the valve is either repaired or replaced. The risks of surgery are operative mortality and postoperative infection or other complications related to hospitalization. General indications for surgery are listed here. Complications related directly to the heart include abscess, valve dehiscence, valve perforation, rupture, and new heart block. Other indications that must be considered on an individual basis include the presence of prosthetic valve as opposed to native valve infection, heart failure unresponsive to medical therapy, recurrent embolic events, persistent bacteremia despite antibiotics, and vegetations that are large, that is greater than one centimeter, increasing in size or due to Staph aureus because of the high risk for embolization.